for 55 Headache Fellows since 1995. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles and numerous chapters. He is a graduate of the AAN's Palatucci and Transforming Leaders programs. He is the past president of the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy, the current president of Miles for Migraine, and the founder, medical advisor, and the president of the board of the Coalition for Headache and Migraine Patients, also known as CHAMP. Um, thank you again, Dr. William Young, for joining us. Please go ahead with your talk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So, um, my career has had a kind of interesting and unusual course. Um, and somehow I have become involved in advocacy and I spend a lot of my time and it's, I think it's been good for my career. It's certainly kept me from burnout. And, um, uh, you know, I hope you'll see how advocacy and, you know, recognizing and treating the stigma of migraine disease uh, can actually you know, enhance our relationships with our patients, enhance our career satisfaction and make it an enormous difference in the quality of life of our patients. Um, so here are my disclosures. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the most relevant disclosures are the um, past presidency of the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy, um, the Coalition for Headache and Migraine Patients of which I'm president of the board and the medical advisor and the president of Miles for Migraine. Um, and it kind of, uh, um, I remember when I was at an AAN meeting and a colleague came up to me um, who uh, I respected greatly, it was a neuromuscular um, headache and, and neuromuscular diseases and said, you know, I'm glad you do headache. I don't like treating those patients. And, you know, And I just felt kind of poorly. Um, so, you know, my, it shouldn't be like that. You know, migraine is an enormously prevalent and an enormously impactful disorder and disease. So in terms of disability, this is all, this, all diseases, um, not just neurologic, it's number two in the world. And in terms of impact, which is a factor which has death and disability, um, <clears throat> it's number 14 in the world. You know, so it shouldn't be you know, something that people ignore or don't want to, um, to uh, uh, deal with. Um, <clears throat> so um, why is that? And it's stigma. Stigma is a construct in the social sciences that um, uh, an attribute Trader disorder is discredited and they're sanctioned. So there's two things. There's that it's discredited. Um, you know, it's looked down upon. The identity is poisoned and there's some kind of sanction. So people pay a price for being stigmatized. And they're generally recognized to be three types of stigma. There's structural stigma where there's prejudice and discrimination in laws and practices. There's public stigma, which is what the patient experiences every day from the you know, mother-in-law who says a nasty thing, from uh, uh, you know, the boss. Um, uh, uh, and then there's self-stigma where after hearing all these sort of negative connotations about the disease, people develop shame and self-esteem and a lack of engagement in their treatment. Um, so, and here's, you know, another way to visualize that process. There's public stigma and structural stigma. And together, over time, people get the message that they are not any good, they're not acceptable, and they do the job themselves. They start to stigmatize themselves. Um, and the self-stigma pro uh, um, process involves stereotyping. Um, uh, agreement where, you know, you hear it so much, it, it must be true. Um, and then this, this becomes internalized and applies to the person themselves. And these can be measured by, um, there's a stigma score for um, neurologic diseases. Um, 
<clears throat> and it has an enacted. So this is the patient telling you what they hear and, um, and a internalized, so what they feel um, about themselves. Um, so uh, about or fairly early in my career, a neurology resident has a month to do research and walks into my office. And the day before I'd read that paper on measuring stigma. And um, uh, so that became her project. She measured stigma in our clinic and in the epilepsy clinic. And it turns out that for people with episodic migraine and for people with epilepsy, now, you know, only the, you know, epilepsy patients who, you know, were cognitively normal were able to, were participating in that, had less stigma than the uh, patients with chronic migraine. And the, there was significantly more stigma in the chronic migraine group than in the other two groups, the episodic and the epilepsy groups. Uh, and I should point out that we chose epilepsy because it is um, you know, well recognized that it is a highly stigmatized disorder. And I'll show you a little bit more evidence about that uh, in a bit. So in our clinics, um, as I said, chronic migraine had more stigma than uh, episodic migraine and epilepsy, but ability to work best predicted the stigma. So um, uh, for both the epilepsy patients and the migraine patients, the, the work uh, was the strongest correlate with stigma. There was a, the mental component strongly correlated with stigma as well, but it's uh, important to think whether that's a cause or an effect. Uh, and the physical component score um, uh, of the SF12, you know, was is it hard to walk upstairs and things like that, only slightly correlated with this stigma process. So in the regression model, chronic migraine and epilepsy were equally stigmatized because the disability was greater in the chronic migraine population than in the epilepsy population. So. Um, it was the same, except for disability was greater, therefore stigma was greater in the migraine population. Uh, and a little bit less in episodic migraine. And the way I explain that is that in the episodic group, um, that's kind of something people understand. You know, you get headache and if you take out the disability, that's okay. But if you're disabled from your headache disease, um, uh, that's bad. And if it's chronic, that's kind of weird. They don't recognize that having a daily headache is kind of a normal thing. Um, uh, so that's a bad brain and like, like epilepsy is responsible for some of the stigma. Um, so Bob Shapiro looked at it in another way and he um, looked at stigma uh, in a panel of people, you know, who would they you know, like their children to marry or who would they like to work with or be their friend. Um, and it turns out that males, non-white people, younger people, those who don't have migraine, those who have a lot of fear of pain, those who have low empathy, empathy uh, those who don't fear migraine and are lower income, stigmatize people with migraine more than, you know, than women or white people or older people. Um, so all of these correlated with being a stigmatizer. And he found as in our survey of, um, of how patients felt about their stigma, he found the same thing in the stigmatizers that if you lost days from work, there was enormously um, more um, stigma associated with the loss of work. Um, and what do people believe is going on in, in persons with migraine? About a third uh, easily attribute the patient's uh, uh, disease to their unhealthy behavior. Again, they're blaming the patient for their migraine. Um, uh, three out of 10 believe that people with migraine use it to gain attention or get out of their commitments. Uh, and uh, those who know more people with migraine tend to hold more negative attitudes towards people with the disease. So, uh, you know, the first two bullet points 
um, you know, I, I see, I kind of understand. Um, but what I think is going on with the third one, in other words, um, if you know a lot of people who have migraine, you tend to think more poorly of them than, uh, than if you don't know them. And um, it may be explained by, you know, the burden of migraine is touching the people who know. It's if you're a family member, you know, and, and, and your family member isn't, you know, taking care of their kids and the burden comes on you, the resentment, I think, comes out in this questionnaire. Um, so, and how does um, migraine uh, show up uh, uh, in terms of stigmatization of diseases in general? So this is very hot off the presses, um, uh, uh, looking at uh, four and a half million news articles that are health related from you know, high quality uh, news services. And um, uh, you can see at the bottom are their neurologic diseases and migraine is the worst one as I'll show you over here. So going back, um, uh, you know, the mental health disorders at the top, addiction, and some of the, ST, of the sexually transmitted infections, STIs, um, are more stigmatized than migraine. Otherwise, migraine uh, is more stigmatized than other neurologic diseases, and here it is. So you can see, you know, there are certain um, uh, uh, neurological diseases that you kind of get a, like a, a little bit of a respect for having them. Uh, and I think that this, in fact, relates to the strength of the advocacy movement. And migraine, you know, stands out as the most stigmatized of the neurologic diseases. Um, stigma has consequences. So here is um, uh, the NIH funding based on disease burden. And so you can see how there's um, a regression line, and if there, a disease has a lot of impact, like ischemic heart disease, um, uh, you know, it has a, a lot of NIH funding. And migraine, and by the way, this is a log-log scale, so, you know, um, the distance is much greater than it looks, and if you draw the line, where would you expect migraine to um, show up if it was treated fairly, um, it would get about 12 times more NIH money than it is actually getting. You know, I, I remember, you know, pointing this out to my chairman and who's an MS doctor. And um, he, uh, you know, immediately I could see, he, he didn't say it, but it, you could see in his brain, like NINDS is gonna shift, you know, $220 million from everybody else into migraine. Uh, you know, that's not good. Uh, so there's a little bit of competition, I think, uh, um, involved in, in uh, you know, people not wanting to recognize what a burden this is to the funding of migraine disease. Um, and in common language, we hear migraine, you know, as a metaphor for devaluation. So here's just a, a typical um, statement from the New York Times using um, uh, the word migraine as a, as a nuisance. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it's really, you know, just, in common language, a bad headache and a more annoying headache. Uh, but it carries two polar uh, meanings. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the affiliation with headache, which is prevalent in 80% of the population in, the, in their life is a mild problem uh, and migraine and don't really get distinguished in the minds of, of people, you know, in common parlance. Uh, and it's become, you know, a term synonymous with vexation or concern. Um, and uh, uh, migraine is therefore reduced from a disease to a triviality or a character flaw, as in poor coping skills, you know, troublesome or annoying. Um, and uh, it, it, thus it uh, fosters not empathy, but antipathy towards the person who has migraine. So the way language is used um, is harmful. Um, and migraine uh, is discredited as a source of disability. So what I'm gonna show you now is um, some 
uh, evidence uh, about how much how hard it is to get recognition for the disability of migraine. So it's the second leading uh, cause of, glo of global disability days, um, but only 22% of employers said that migraine was a serious enough reason to be absent from work. Um, and most of the work lost is presenteeism. So the person with migraine sits at work, but isn't able to do their job efficiently. Um, and, uh, uh, um, so how does this translate into people getting uh, disability uh, if they s apply for governmental disability, for recognition from the government? So um, uh, the initial allowance rate for migraine is 23%, uh, whereas for all claimants, it's 46%. Uh, and, you know, when you think of you know, migraine is the second leading cause of disabled disability days. Um, it's uh, uh, on, only getting 0.3% of uh, SSDI claims successfully um, uh, managed or su successful applications, where is almost 6% of the um, US y YLDs or years of life lost with disability. Um, so there's an enormous, uh, um, it's enormously unlikely that social security is gonna recognize the disability of migraine. Uh, and in fact, that's an 18.6 fold disparity. And here is um, the percent allowed uh, for all claimants, it's over here. For the migraine claimants are kind of at the bottom of the list in terms of the likelihood of getting an SSDI allowance. And part of this is that there is actually no blue book category for, for migraine to get disability. Um, and one more co consequence is that stigma uh, worsens the pain, at least I believe that. Um, uh, there's evidence that racial discrimination uh, worsens pain. Um, uh, so migraine symptoms lead to migraine disability, lead to stigma, which leads to poor quality of life, leads to more migraine symptoms, and then more disability. So the vicious cycle um, uh, by which uh, stigma can actually make the migraine itself worse. Uh, now, you know, this is a problem. Stigma is a problem. Another the word that uh, people use is disease framing. So the way a disease is framed has a profound effect on how the public perceives and, and supports it. And uh, advocacy movements talk about reframing. So for HIV, um, the disease was reframed. And, and, you know, I was an intern when um, uh, HIV sort of exploded into the public's consciousness. Um, and the advocacy movement sort of, um, sort of took advantage of, um, you know, the stigma and um, uh, the unfairness of the way the Reagan administration and society in general were treating people to reframe it in terms of justice um, and to, you know, profoundly change. Um, access to resources and to research and to everything else for people with HIV. Um, what used to be called impotence has been reframed as uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, and that has been an enormously successful campaign at destigmatizing a disease and another sort of area uh, where uh, re disease reframing has been fabulously successful is in cancer. Uh, when it used to be the cancer victim to the cancer survivor or even the warrior. Um, so migraine itself has a lousy frame and this can be seen um, as an easy to treat condition of white middle-class women, typically um, a woman who cannot cope. Uh, migraine is a metaphor for something that is irritating. Um, uh, and in scientific presentations, people talk about the migraine brain as a more sensitive brain, as a brain that cannot handle stress. Um, so uh, 
It has not always been like that. So in the 1700s, migraine went from a neutral frame to a very negative one. And this was a rather sudden uh, transition. And, you know, I find that very interesting. Why, why, if you look in medieval literature and, you know, any other time frame in society, you can't find anything negative said about migraine disease and mentions, you know, it's just as significant as, you know, someone who has a broken bone or, um, you know, tuberculosis, um, you know, it's taken equally seriously. Um, uh, and it turns out that, you know, this happened in the, in the 17th, uh, 1700s. Um, and this is characterized by, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of ridicule that was heaped upon both the people who had migraine and the doctors who take care of them. So uh, in those days, there were these grand balls and masks and people would dress up as, you know, interesting or funny things. So in May of 1782, a flamboyant character graced the King's Theater masquerade in London, gliding him, his way past the Venetian sailor, the gentleman in a coat of two different colors, and the unusual, the usual unremarkable cons, costumes of some 800 attendees. The high German doctor cut a dashing figure. He introduced himself to the gathering as Le Sieur Francois de Migraine, Docteur de Médecine. So, you know, people who take care of these trivial, you know, flamboyant patients and their flamboyant, irrelevant doctors. Um, uh, you know, sort of characterize this new uh, frame uh, towards migraine. Uh, and Freud, you know, kind of blamed the patient too. Migraine represents a toxic effect produced by sexual stimulating substance when this cannot find sufficient discharge. So um, sexually repressed. Um, so why was this change? Why did this change occur. And, you know, nobody's, you know, I don't know how historians can prove it. Nobody has exactly addressed this question, but I have, you know, two um, uh, explanations that, that I think might be relevant. One is that, you know, the 1700s, you know, show me the data. Um, it was the age of reason. And, you know, people could do autopsies on other things and find a cause and you couldn't do that for migraine. So, um, uh, uh, you know, as medicine became more scientific um, and migraine was unexplained, um, uh, it began to be stigmatized. And I also think, you know, thinking back to work, I think that the nature of work with industrialization and was changing and that, you know, while the clock, you know, reached the village square maybe you know, in the, in the 1200s, um, you know, people at, around this time, people started to have to show up at work on time and you couldn't, you know, take a couple of hours off because you had a migraine attack. Um, so th those are the two possible explanations. And I, I'd be very interested in if people can come up with others and have any idea how to, how to prove that either of these or something else might be true. But it's, the point is that, you know, migraine doesn't have to be stigmatized. It doesn't have to have a lousy frame. And um, uh, it's a modern phenomenon and reversing 300 years of uh, stigmatization uh, is hard, but it is not impossible. Um, so naming. Uh, the how we name a disease or condition reflects both biomedical evidence and but it's also a social process of negotiation you know an example is obesity um you know that that has gone back and forth i don't know that it's you know whether obesity is a disease or or not uh, whether that's fully established but uh, you know, others have sort of taken their place. Osteoporosis has become a disease. Erectile dysfunction went from a symptom to a disease. Um, and uh, L LGBTQ went from uh, a, me a medical condition in the, um, 
uh, in the psychiatric uh, classification and it's demedicalized. Um, and people accuse uh, uh, you know, disease advocates of, of mongering, of uh, that it's a marketing ploy by pharmaceutical uh, companies to make something more important. It's a disease and therefore, you know, it, treatment and should be paid for uh, as opposed to a condition. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I set about to study this, uh, a Delphi panel, um, uh, and uh, one word of advice, never make a Delphi panel with 17 people in them. There were neuroscientists and um, uh, uh, lang linguistic experts and headache patients and headache doctors and primary care doctors. Um, and um, it was awful, like herding cats. But they were able to agree that one should say migraine and not migraine headache that words with a psychiatric valence should be avoided, that sufferer uh, you know, should not be used um, uh, by the doctor um, and its use should be limited and determined by the patient. Um, and that the variability of symptoms, um, you know, migraine has such a broad spectrum of symptom presentations. Uh, you know, that actually the, the elasticity of the language may actually um, be valuable for the de describing migraine. Uh, you know, for some people, you know, it may be a condition uh, or not a disease if you get an aura twice in your life. Um, you know, I, I'm rather not call that a disease. Um, uh, so, and we agreed to disagree um, about uh, disease, but disease won by a plurality. Uh, and migraineur was a tough one. You know, I, I went into the panel, you know, I, I was sort of the non-voting person, but I was, you know, I like that word migraineur. But, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not what, uh, you know, the psychologists tell us we should be doing that don't label the person with their disease, a uh, person with migraine. Um, uh, but, you know, many people were, um, uh, you know, like the term migraineur and didn't find it problematical. So my, this process was adopted by the Coalition of Headache Patients, which is where I think it should live. And this is their final recommendation. So you can call it a disease, a condition sometime. Do, don't say migraines. Let, let me, um, and don't say migraine headache. So why not say migraines? You don't say asthmas. It's a very subtle, when you say migraines, it's a very subtle way of taking a chronic condition and making it to, into occasional attacks. Um, say the coalition prefers person with migraine, not migraineur. They don't like migraine sufferer. They really don't like migraine personality or migraine type person. Um, and they don't like medication overuse headache, um, which is, you know, the current uh, classification has migraine um, uh, uh, overuse headache is the proper term. If you want to publish a paper, you can't say rebound and you can't say medication adaptation headache, which I think is more scientifically correct. Um, so, uh, you know, just to reiterate, it kind of blames the patient to say medication overuse. Um, no, it is better. It used to be medication abuse headache. Um, but, uh, you know, there is scientific evidence that there is a brain adaptation and you, you can cause uh, something that resembles um, a, a daily headache by giving triptans to certain rats and other things. So there is a brain adaptation process, but uh, uh, you know, the our patients with migraine don't like uh, a medication overuse headache. So I always say rebound to them and uh, medication adaptation headache in the chart. Um, so um, what's the interaction of advocacy and stigma? Because advocacy um, is an you know, is really the only way to destigmatize a disease. Um, 
So uh, in the 1960s, so Rachel Best, again, um, uh, sh she's the one who measured, you know, stigma in four and a half million newspaper uh, articles about health conditions. Um, so in the 1960s, she tells us, you know, scientists, you know, were seen as the beneficiaries of NIH funding and cool science, like that was what NIH was about. And it was disease advocates who changed the, the meaning of medical research. And it's a benefit of a citizen to have research about their disease now. Um, and once patients, but the other, the flip side of the coin is that once patients were identified as the beneficiaries of the NIH funding, then, then the, the moral judgments about who deserves the funding uh, you know, entered, you know, the process of what science studied, um, you know, so the classic example um, is that uh, lung cancer uh, is underfunded relative to breast cancer, causes more deaths, but, you know, it's viewed as the, as being caused by the patient themselves, so they get less research. Um, you know, other, other ways that, you know, society makes judgments is it chooses mortality over disability. So if you look at, you know, the, the um, global burden of disease and how they calculate, um, you know, and, and balance death versus disability, um, you, you know, you get a number, but the NIH is more into using mortality rather than dis than incorporating the disability factor as strongly as the global burden of disease study does. Um, you know, people who get diseases that predominantly affect racial minorities or uh, women uh, get less funding. Um, uh, <clears throat> and just to point out that while there have been you know, notable um, successes, uh, you know, the, the successful path of destigmatization and um, getting uh, more NIH funding or more societal benefits uh, is quite anomalous. Um, so how does one change the frame of migraine or anything? Um, uh, and, you know, it's advocacy. And for those of you out there who might have a passion for this, it really is a, a wonderful way to contribute to your field, you know, you're a physician, you see these people, you see how the stigma, you know, if you look for it, you'll see how the stigma of whatever disease they have, um, you know, is affecting their healthcare. And we have a responsibility to recognize it and to advocate for our patients in the, uh, you know, at the local level, at the level, uh, you know, in the office. Um, but we have this unique position from our knowledge of science uh, uh, from our epidemiologic understanding of the impact, uh, you know, we see the, the resource uh, uh, that are available to people in a way that patients don't. Um, we have knowledge about the uh, information pipeline uh, and we have access to the patient groups. So patients love their doctors, uh, you know, by and large, and they'll listen to us if, if we listen to them uh, and talk to them, they want to hear from us. Um, uh, and, and we meet people we, who should be in effective coalitions to advocate for patients. So doctors are, are you know, at the center uh, of the group of people who need to be advocating to destigmatize disease. Um, so the Coalition for Headache and Migraine Patients put together a symposium to uh, shut the door on migraine stigma, uh, you know, and we invited, you know, uh, uh, experts in uh, disease stigma, you know, from mental health. And, uh, you know, we brought in the epilepsy uh, community, um, lung cancer was there. Um, and uh, the number one thing is disclosure, you know, particularly for migraine, which is an invisible disease. And, um, you know, the, the norm is to hide it as much as possible until only the most extreme version can actually, you know, pop out from the, the, this 
you know, effort to suppress awareness that a person has migraine. So, you know, we need to teach our patients to how to talk and how to disclose and not just to do it, but to do it well. Um, we, need, we need to frame the patient in, a, in an empathetic way and nurture empathy for them and their condition. We need to recognize that disability is the key and we need to normalize a disability from migraine. You know, it is the sick headache, um, disability, talking about disability and telling them that that's normal uh, is extremely helpful. Um, uh, we did learn that new frames can harm. So, um, you know, about 15 years ago, the mental health group were, um, you know, we're saying, well, we can show that this is a brain disease and this is going to help. Um, and it did not. Like calling something a brain disease was not useful to the mental health community. And they've given up on, you know, making it more scientific and saying, you know, that this is real. What they, they're all about disclosure. Like, um, uh, you know, in, in talking to headache experts, they want to say to their patients and patients don't mind hearing, you know, this is, this is a real thing. You know, there's something going on in the brain and there's inflammation in the trigeminal nerve and all these, uh, you know, uh, you know, migraine centers in the brain are lighting up on your PET scan. And, you know, it really is a real thing. And that has uh, no value. It turns out to destigmatizing migraine um, or, or a disease. And I don't think it is, value for destigmatizing migraine. You know, patients have to lead. Like we have to, uh, you know, teach patients and allow them and give them, uh, you know, this, all of the successful advocacy movements were patient driven. Think of AIDS, think of breast cancer, you know, doctors helped, but they let the patients do their thing. Um, and then it's, a it's needs multiple prongs. We need prongs for structural stigma. We need um, uh, the public stigma. The interpersonal stigma needs to be addressed and patients need to address their own internalized stigma. Um, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy. This was, you know, one of the first groups, um, uh, you know, and this is very late compared to other things, but, you know, this is, uh, this is, dealing with institutional uh, structural stigma. So this goes to um, NIH um, and tries to get more funding, oxygen for cluster headache, um, setting up, creating VA and Indian Health Services Centers of Excellence. And here's a more, a more thorough list of the issues that have been advocated for by the uh, AHDA with um, uh, uh, you know, addressing, for example, uh, NIH funding, you know, which, by the way, we have not made a lot of progress in. So first, uh, we were able to add migraine and headache as categories of NIH expenditure. You can't hold them to task if they won't tell you how many, you know, grants that relate to migraine uh, are funding, are funded. Um, we've fought for fair review by NIH reviewers who know, at least know something about headache. Um, uh, uh, we've tried to get RFPs for headache related grants with limited success. Um, we've tried to get NIH and we're currently trying to get NIH to, you know, have to justify to Congress, you know, how their expenditures relate to disease burden, you know, uh, and one way that we've asked for is to improve the pay line for headache related grants, you know, it turns out that, you know, well, 10% of grants, let's say, are funded, you know, there's really no difference between, you know, the, the quality of the grant or the likelihood of, you know, having a good result from that grant, you know, doesn't really go down until you get above 25%. So you can, you know, change the pay line for, for grants without, you know, reducing uh, you know, the, the impact of the dollars spent by NIH. You can increase, um, we've increased headache funding through the CD uh, uh, MR 
P, the congressionally directed medical research program, which is attached to the military budget. And we've gotten grants for headache there. We've improved uh, access by establishing VA centers of excellence and recently increased, tried to increase the number of established centers. Last year, we asked for the Indian Health Service uh, centers of excellence. Um, uh, we've been working for oxygen coverage for cluster headache, which you know, is, you know, it's just a joke that, um, that CMS decided not to cover uh, oxygen for cluster headache. Um, and uh, we've worked to add headache disorders to the Social Security Administration Blue Book listing of impairments. Um, uh, my, I'm the president of Miles for Migraine. Uh, you know, it is, it's uh, not just walk, run, uh, rest activities, it's participatory advocacy. You know, our belief at Miles for Migraine is that, you know, virtual uh, Facebook groups, things like that are not as effective as when people meet each other, when people with uh, migraine or other headache disorders meet each other in person. And that, um, you know, there's very little value from an advocacy standpoint um, you know, for much of the online activity and advocacy that's going on. So we try to get live events um, uh, and the money raised by uh, Miles for Migraine goes to fellowship programs for research and education. And so we try to link, you know, the fundraising to improve headache care and create new science locally, um, you know, so patients will come out for their community. And, you know, this is the growth by participants. We've gone from when I joined two races, um, we were the second one to now we have 24. And last year we gave out um, $690,000 to 24 um, headache fellowship programs. Um, uh, so other than the uh, walk, run, relax events, we have adolescent camps, you know, sort of day activities where the kids get together, in-person support groups, uh, education days, meetups, local chapters are, are the latest thing. You know, if you look at an advocacy movement, you know, like breast cancer, there are chapters in every major city. And, um, you know, in, in the epilepsy, there's Eastern and Western Pennsylvania, um, Epilepsy uh, Society, um, uh, you know, migraine is way behind. So we're trying to get local chapters and bring advocacy into the local um, community. Um, and uh, the Coalition for Headache and Migraine Patients, CHAMP, um, we met in a bar uh, about six years ago. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about how discombobulated the uh, patient and physician groups were um, and jotted out this idea on the back of an envelope. And this was just before the CGRPs were coming. And within two months, the Coalition for Headache and Migraine uh, Patients sprung into existence. We hired uh, an executive director. Um, you know, we've, we try to um, pull out the uh, patient voice from groups like the National Headache Foundation and the uh, American Migraine Disease Association, um, which have doctors and physicians. We have peer physician groups. We have for-profit like migraine.com who are part of this. We have you know, some of the top bloggers. So we can reach you know, many, many people with uh, headache diseases. And we have cluster busters, which is you know, entirely a, 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 a patient-driven organization. Um, so, you know, I think we've been able to create a lot of cohesion, a sense of shared mission. We, um, the CHAMP supports each member, um, patient um, uh, energy uh, is incredible. You know, um, uh, you know, doctors just don't, aren't able to do what, what these patients can do, you know, with their energy and passion. You know, we're so... Uh, you know, our lives are so complicated, we can't do that. Um, one example, uh, some of you may know what ICER is. They're a group that assigns value to um, uh, 
you know, how much a drug might be worth for, you know, based upon how much good it does. And when the migraine drugs were being evaluated, you know, a little bit unfairly because, you know, the process kind of, you know, stinks for a pain condition, uh, we had, you know, 200 patient voices heard by this, by the ICER group, whereas typically they'll have three or four. Um, when Elle magazine came up with the migraine look, which was, you know, extremely attractive women kind of making their faces pushing on their head, like a, you know, headache person is trying to, does, and, you know, is a way to, you know, make the cheeks more attractive or something like that, pull back the skin. They called it the migraine look and <laughs> champ was meeting and they were all over it. And within a couple of days, the story became more about the patient, you know, revulsion at this, than it was about, um, you know, the, the uh, L's migraine look. Um, uh, Retreat Migraine is a patient conference. So it's for chronic migraine by patients with chronic migraine. They define the culture. And it's amazing, you know, that when you walk into a room and somebody's going to give a talk, you know, the first minute we'll be discussing whether the lights are, are um, uh, right or not, and whether what's the most comfortable light for the group. Um, and uh, we don't clap at a chat meeting. Uh, at a at a um, uh, shut at, <clears throat> at a um, uh, retreat migraine. This we use the deaf clap because the noise of clapping when you have a bad migraine attack, um, you know, is very disturbing. Um, so uh, and and you know, if a patient becomes disabled and is in their room, you know, because of a migraine attack at a retreat migraine conference, you know, they, they have teams that'll go up and visit them and make sure that, you know, they've got their medicine and they've got their, their water and, and, you know, they help them and, and uh, uh, give support. Uh, there's a dif diversity and inclusion, uh, you know, trying to reach, uh, teaches how to reach patients from diverse backgrounds. Um, uh, there's mapping the migraine journey, identifying barriers to care. Um, uh, you know, there's such a shortage of headache doctors that the patient community wants to make available resources on how to get trained up and become and develop headache expertise. And the most successful, amazing thing is migraine at school. Migraine at school is um, uh, in the state of Utah, it's become mandatory for there to be screening uh, for migraine in middle and high school. And uh, there has to be some form of education about migraine in, the, in their health classes. Uh, and the migraine at school materials to help uh, kids, um, you know, get the proper attention and care for their migraine are, are distributed through the schools in Utah. Um, and, you know, to me, that's, you know, first of all, this was created by the stigma committee. So the materials are guaranteed to not be stigmatizing, taking a very matter of fact approach um, and a way to teach not just the kids that it's not stigmatizing to have migraine, but their parents and their administrators. Uh, at the same time. Um, so, you know, just to point out, this is the diverse CHAMP membership. Um, and um, there are other organizations and most of them do patient education. Uh, there's migraine at work. You know, you, you can understand how that is, uh, you know, really important to, to bring awareness and understanding of migraine into the workplace. For cluster headache, there's education, there's oxygen, and you know work on this on the psychedelic uh, 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 um, psilocybin, for example, uh, you know is probably effective uh, in the uh, uh, in cluster headache management. Uh, for policy, there's the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy and another organization. Um, and for access, the Patient Advocate Foundation. So, um, you know, there are a lot of groups and um, uh, that are doing advocacy, and yet it is tiny. So, 
Um, this is just my final thought. Um, you know, I looked at, you know, or organizations, the, the, I think they're the 990s um, for, you know, all the organizations, the C3s that um, uh, uh, relate to these diseases, how much NIH is spending, uh, um, uh, what their dailies are, their disability adjusted life years, that's the factor with both death and disability, um, and related it to um, uh, the NIH funding and to uh, the largest organization. So let me just go compare here for us migraine and um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. So just to look, migraine has more dailies than Alzheimer's. It's, it's neck and neck, you know, 1.83% of the dailies versus 1.86. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you know, uh, next time Alzheimer's with the aging population, you know, is higher than migraine, but it's close and uh, almost the same. So the largest organization in 2019, believe it or not, was Miles for Migraine at $1.3 million. The Alzheimer's Foundation had $390 million uh, of uh, funding um, uh, in, uh, <coughs> in terms of NIH. Uh, um, migraine that year had 25 million and Alzheimer's had 2.2 billion um, relative to the dailies. You know, that's, uh, you know, 1,224 1, 1, divided by 15. So, you know, uh, I guess that's, uh, um, uh, you know, a little less than a hundred times uh, more spent on an Alzheimer's daily than a migraine daily. Um, and then in terms of the, uh, the disability divided by the largest uh, patient organization, I didn't have the time to sort of like add up all the numbers, uh, you know, for the organizations and the organizations are kind of tricky. So, uh, you know, this isn't a great number, but, uh, you know, there's much more parity when you count the, um, uh, the amount of advocacy that's available, you know, that uh, um, compared to the NIH funding. So, um, you know, as Rachel Best predicted, um, you know, the strength of the advocacy movement uh, is a better predictor of um, NIH spending than the, than the impact of the disease. So the bottom line is, you know, from a destigmatization and from an advocacy point of view, you know, we started, there's been a lot of growth and there's a 